Hello, uh, my name is Nathan Wheat. Thank you very much for uh, signing up uh, to be victims in my course. I really appreciate all of you um, uh, taking the time in order to be uh, in order to do this, and I really appreciate all of your patience, especially given all of the challenges that we're facing right now involving coronavirus. And so, going forward, all of us are, I think are really kind of struggling in order to be able to figure out what's the best way we can build a good learning environment, uh, despite all the restrictions that social distancing uh, end up posing. And so this course, to some extent, is going to be experimental, unfortunately. Um, and that means that we're going to have, have to do some things that are relatively new, relatively creative, and I hope many of you will bear with me and give me good feedback along the way about what works and what doesn't work. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to do what will help you as much as possible uh, through, throughout this uh, unconventional learning process. And so, just to give you a little bit of background about me, I'm a, I'm a new professor at the University of Washington. I've um, been working in quantum algorithms and quantum computing for quite some time, actually. Um, I've been, I got my PhD around 2011 and spent, oh, about six years uh, working at Microsoft Research uh, right across the, the lake from us um, until about last year when I came to join the university. and. Um, um, basically, teaching this course has been one of my dreams, uh, to be honest, and uh, I'm really grateful even under these circumstances that I get the opportunity to teach you all about quantum computing, which is probably my biggest passion in life. So that being said, how are we going to uh, go about logistically for this? So the logistics for this are going to be, as I mentioned, unconventional. The first thing that we're, we, I'm going to aim to do is, as much as possible, I'm going to aim to deliver pre-recorded lectures uh, beforehand. The reason for this is because of the fact that, quite frankly, this is all relatively new technology and we were all kind of forced to jump into this relatively quickly. And so I don't necessarily know what the bandwidth restrictions on both my end, the server, as well as on your end are going to be. So for the, that reason, I figured, well, having as a fallback pre-recorded delivery for everything is probably going to be a really good idea just to make sure that we're, we're covered. So that'll be the, the main form of it. So I would encourage people to ideally take a look at these recordings either before or actually even during the lecture if you prefer. The lecture period, ideally, I'm setting up in hopes of it being as interactive as possible. There's something that's kind of a lot easier, I think, about face-to-face -face interactions in a classroom setting that online so far it hasn't really convinced me that it can replicate, although I'd be happy to be proven wrong in the course of this course. And so to that end, I've decided to view the online the online Zoom meetings that we're going to be having twice a week as ideally periods for, uh, for me to answer questions um, and for me to clarify, ideally, on the things that are discussed in the pre-recorded lectures. Now, of course, if the pre-recorded lectures aren't clear, I'm happy to go through and do do everything all over again, live stream. But again, you know, we'll see how that ends up going. Basically, my goal for those will be to do whatever the class needs in order to be able to master the material as quickly as possible. So that's that's basically it. Before going you now jumping into the material, which is I'm sure what all of us really want to do, I've got to spend some time um, talking about the syllabus for this uh, this course. So, ideally, I'm going to um, set the uh, set this up so that we can in interact during the uh, regularly scheduled courses Monday and Wednesday, 1:30 to 2:50. Um, but also, I'll make myself available over Skype uh, from Tuesday, Thursday from 3 to 4, and you can reach me at the, at the, the following Skype ID up there anytime, if, uh, in case you want to bring up something that might be a little bit harder to bring up during, uh, during class.
class or you need something something um, uh, explained or settled. So please just reach out to me anytime you've got any questions, either by email or directly uh, by Skype if needed, and I'll do whatever I possibly can in order to to deal uh, to help you. So the way the course will be evaluated is as follows. We're starting next week, not this week. You're off the hook this week. Don't worry about that. But starting next week, we're going to have weekly assignments. And these assignments will be um, ideally set up in order to test your learning in the, in the subject. The majority of the assignments will be, of course, covering the material that, um, that we're covering in that given week. But there's also going to be occasionally other questions that I'll throw on the assignments that'll typically be on the easier side that are designed in order to jog your memory and keep, uh, keep your recollection of some of the previous stuff current. The main reason why is because of the fact that we've got a lot of material in the, this course, and I know that if I were in your shoes, one exposure to much of this material definitely would not be enough. So I want to continue, continue to re-inoculate you against uh, some of these things. Oh gosh, pandemics are definitely on my mind right now. <laughs> but the, in lieu of a final exam, which is a little bit difficult to do under these circumstances, we're going to be evaluating the remainder of this via a final project. The final project, its purpose is to really give you an opportunity to show your understanding of not just the subject matter, but also your understanding kind of the broader um, context behind uh, the algorithms that we're, we'll be discussing in this course. So the final project will basically be uh, up to the user, up to the student's choice, a um, write up either about a uh, research paper uh, in quantum computing. So you'll in, in, in consultation with me, you'll go out and you'll find some topic that you find interesting in quantum computing. And then the aim of this is to write a detailed report in LaTeX up for this. And this report should have enough detail to convince me that you understand absolutely everything in that paper. So. The things that I'm looking for is I'm uh, for evaluating this is I'm looking for well apart from the obvious of a clear cogent description of the material that's being covered. Also, I'd like I'd like to be able to see signs that you understand the technical details and avoid hand waving arguments and put in as much mathematical detail between the lines for for the exposition that uh, uh, that exists in many of these papers. Alternatively, rather than taking on some uh, some research paper, um, another thing that that you can do at your option is to write a implementation of a quantum algorithm in a quantum programming language of your choice. In which case, again, it will still be evaluated in terms of the um, of the write up, but the quality of the, the source code and the comments uh, within will also be used as a criteria for gauging whether or not you understand the material. At the end of the, the day, that is really mostly what I'm looking for. What I want is I want to see clear indications that you've mastered the material and that you have a deep understanding of what quantum computing is and ideally where it gets its power from. And so the final project itself will be uh, evaluated out of 100 points, and 60 of those will be uh, based on demonstration of your technical strength, i.e. can you show that you understand the individual steps involved, and can you show that you're capable of going through the entire description without, as I said, hand-waving or without skipping any, uh, any clear steps. A remaining 30% is going to be based on clarity of, uh, of uh, exposition. If you're capable of writing this at a standard where the you, if you presented the material to past you before you took the course, whether it, if it would be good enough for you to be able to understand and learn the subject matter going in, then you'll get 30 out of 30. 20 points, well, you know, if it's legible to me, who already uh, probably uh, knows the material pretty well that you're going to be talking about, then you get 20 out of it. And lower than that, well, it's, uh, it's probably not all that intelligible. And so likely 
I, I expect most of the, the scores to be scattered, uh, scattered around that range. Also, 10 points will be uh, assigned for proper formatting of the bibliography and submission of the outline of this research project on time. Halfway through the course, there will be a deadline set up for an outline for what your uh, presentation is going to be. And that is uh, something that we're going to be uh, working together on. So we'll chat about this, find some pro topic and project that potentially is, is interesting for you, and then you, uh, you'll be able to proceed uh, going forward on that. Um, again, this deadline will be occurring on May 13th, and beyond that, the final paper itself will be due June 8th. Now, with work, with extensions and makeup, look, I recognize right now that we're living under very unusual times. So, in the event that life ends up getting in the way, for any reason whatsoever, just talk to me. We can, we can work things out under, for almost all reasonable circumstances. Um, and all of this will be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, and please, reach out to me earlier rather than later when it comes to any anything that you may need, because the earlier you reach out to me involving extensions or makeup work, the sooner, the sooner and better we'll be able to deal with these particular problems. Also, one of the things that I should mention is that we've got, I, I'll be holding multiple office hours a week as well as the um, regular set time during the, the courses where we can interact. But again, if you need any feedback or any help whatsoever, just reach out. I, I, I love talking about this stuff. So, uh, in fact, I like talking about this so much, I'm currently talking to my computer about it. But anyways, if you want to talk to me, just reach out. I'm more than happy. Also, the other thing that I, I hate to mention this, but this is, this is important. Everyone it, taking this course, given the fact that it's on, in an online environment, has the right to be treated respectfully. So please, just be 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 respectful and be courteous, especially for uh, an environment like this where we're dealing with people who are interacting under strange circumstances. And on top of that, the other thing is, is many of us are coming from very diverse backgrounds. So. Be, uh, I would encourage everybody to be supportive and as helpful as possible to, uh, to your colleagues. Any accommodations that you might need regarding disabilities will be dealt with again on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. And please, again, reach out as early as possible if anything uh, comes up regarding this. So regarding the final topic, the university has a policy where the um, work being presented is intended to be done um, individually. Now, that being said, you can clearly communicate with, uh, with each other regarding this, brainstorm ideas, things like this. The ultimate work, though, that ends up hitting the page should be from you, meaning that I do not want to see exact duplicates of anything that people have put out. Show me that, you know, you are capable of internalizing all of these things, even if some of the ideas came up in discussion with other people. When it comes to the final project, final project is to be done completely 100% independently. You are not to um, work collaboratively or bounce ideas off of anybody else. Uh, however, in the event that you want to um, get feedback on the final project earlier in the process, please reach out to me and I'll do my best in order to be able to give you any feedback that you, you would need prior to submission. And so, well, that's, that's basically that. Um, I ask you if you have any questions, but I guess that's kind of uh, a bit of an impossibility for, for a pre-recorded version. So, if that's the case, let's get started with talking about quantum computing. So quantum computing, to me, the core idea behind it is really asking the question of what the computational power of 
nature is. And so quantum computing originally began in 1980, and it was um, originally proposed by uh, Yuri Manin, uh, who's a, a, a Russian mathematician, and uh, also in, uh, independently in 1982 by uh, Richard Feynman, a American physicist. Now, Yuri Manin, he was the first person to kind of ask this question of what are the kind of the fundamental limits to us storing information? And from Yuri's perspective, well, the smallest that we could ever store information in would be in individual quantum states of matter. And so he proposed, he proposed looking, looking into that. But one of the problems with Manin's work is that Manin really didn't clearly articulate why you would want to build a quantum computer. Richard Feynman, on the other hand, and ended up getting a lot more recognition for this because of the fact that he not only suggested quantum computing, but he also proposed an application, an application that actually could provide potentially exponential advantages over ordinary computers. And so this idea that Feynman ended up having ended up stemming from this observation that he had. And it's a rather shocking and scary observation when you think about it. And the observation was that for even incredibly simple systems, the laws of quantum mechanics are actually computationally intractable to solve. And so to give you an idea, right, in quantum mechanics, what you have to do is a quantum mechanics ends up tracking an object, which is called, you know, a quantum wave function. Psi over here is the conventional symbol that everybody uses for it. And so this wave function, what it does is it tracks uh, every possible configuration for a system. So to give you an idea about this, let's imagine that, you know, we've got a, a two-level system, right? A system that can either be 0 or 1. We'll get into this in a lot more detail later on when we start, when I, when I, when I teach you about quantum theory. But for now, let's just imagine we've got a bit. The bit can be either 0 or 1. Well, there's two possible combinations that we can have here. We can just have 0 or 1. Now, if we've got two bits, then two bits we have, well, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. We've got four possibilities for two bits. Now, this is exactly the same idea behind binary encoding. And so with, in general, if we have n bits, then we have 2 to the n numbers that we can represent. However, with a quantum system, we actually have to implicitly, the object behind it, the wave function, is a distribution over 2 to the n numbers. So this means that if we have a quantum distribution on n bits, this means that we've got to track 2 to the n possibilities. Now, okay, you might think, all right, that that isn't that isn't um, all that scary. If you had imagine a probability distribution on um, on a hundred coins, then basically, the in order to specify that probability distribution on a hundred coins in principle, there are well two to the hundred different possibilities that you would have to output the probability for. So similarly, a classical distribution has just as many options. The difference is, is that the quantum wave function is not positive. And this implies that it can't be simulated by stochastic sampling. 
Or more accurately, if we try to use stochastic sampling in order to be able to do this typically for, for the many systems, what ends up happening is that the variance that we end up getting because of the positive and negative contributions that nearly cancel out in psi ends up becoming huge. And so this requires us to have an exponentially large number of samples. So f to give you an idea about this, the probability distribution on 100 coins, that's actually very similar to the kind of quantum state that you would need in order to simulate a molecule with 100 um, orbitals in it, or spin orbitals more accurately. And so this ends up saying that even relatively simple molecules that have precious few uh, degrees of freedom for you to track are actually practically impossible to simulate. And so this is what fi motivated Feynman to propose that actually, well, maybe there's a better way of dealing with this. Maybe instead of struggling up against the negativity of the quantum state, maybe the right thing to do is to actually build quantum mechanics into our computational model. And so that's that's basically what the idea of quantum computing is. The idea is, is that, well, fundamentally, physics seems to be in, uh, engaging in some computational tasks that are incredibly costly, just on an everyday basis. So the question is, can we turn this liability into an asset? Can we leverage quantum effects for computation? Now, before we get started, there's a couple of things that I want to just, you know, clear out just to make sure. In principle, anything that you can do on an ordinary computer, i.e. a Turing machine, can be simulated um, by a quantum a computer, but conversely, the other way is true. So quantum computers, in principle, can't do anything that an ordinary computer couldn't do to begin with. The main thing that a quantum, uh, at least for processing data, the main thing that a quantum computer can do is that the gate and query complexity uh, required in order to solve particular problems can be dramatically lower than it is in ordinary systems by using quantum properties and predominantly interference as well as other forms of uh, what the people in foundations call non-contextuality or sorry contextuality i'll get into this the these issues much later but in any case that's the basic idea we want to leverage quantum effects for co computation and the question is well why why do we really want to do this well i mean this is it's kind of a really big question i think if we're taking a look at molecules. There's many molecules that are much larger than this that we would like to simulate. But at present, the computing resources that would be required to solve even some relatively simple problems in chemistry are beyond what we could do, even if we turned the planet over to a giant supercomputer. So this actually ends up raising, I think, a more interesting question. And this question is, raised essentially by what's known as the extended Church-Turing thesis. And the idea behind the extended Church-Turing thesis is, look, extended Church-Turing thesis is a religious belief. It states that the all physically realistic models of computing can be efficiently simulated by a 
probabilistic Turing machine. Okay, and again, by efficiently, what we mean is efficiently implies using a uh, number of operations that scales at most polynomially with uh, the input. Okay, so from this perspective, this notion of efficient simulation allows us to build equivalence classes between different models of computing. And so that is kind of at the heart of what quantum computing is about, is, well, is this true? And quantum computing is probably the biggest challenge that's been levied against this, because if valid, the laws of quantum mechanics end up strongly suggesting that actually this extended church turing thesis may be false as as written and in fact perhaps it should be generalized into something that is more like a quantum turing machine okay and this is the idea now of course we don't necessarily know whether or not quantum mechanics is the ultimate theory in the event that we find this to be not true, and that there's some other theory of nature, we may need to even change this. You know, put in a, like a string theory computer in the event that we end up finding that quantum gravity um, and string theory cannot be efficiently simulated using a quantum computer. But the entire program really is asking, well, by building in by giving our computers access to all of the laws of physics that we know of, what can we do? And what physical processes can we describe? And this to me is very exciting because of the fact that it allows us to actually look at physics very differently. Instead of, you know, looking at a individual, you know, atom and saying, okay, well, you know, can I predict the um can i predict the dynamics of say an electron moving around all right but the instead of say uh, asking a question like this we can ask another question by saying what is the computational power of physical systems like this. And just like quantum, uh, just like Shannon allowed us through inform uh, information theory to be able to quantify what the informational content of a signal is, quantum computing gives us at least the best language that we've discovered so far to think about what the physical, uh, the computational power of abstract physical systems that obey the laws of quantum mechanics are. And so that's that's what quantum computing is about. Now, as time went on, there's a number of things that ended up, of course, grabbing people's attention about this. Perhaps the most famous example is Shor's algorithm for factoring, which showed that factoring can actually be solved in pol um, polynomial time on a quantum computer. Whereas no sub, uh, where, whereas no polynomial time algorithm is known to exist on um, on ordinary computers, so that actually uh, threatens to fundamentally change the way that we end up approaching cryptography. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But this course isn't actually going to be focusing as much on Shor's algorithm. Rather, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be primarily building up the fundamental techniques that will help you understand how to build quantum algorithms, how to analyze quantum algorithms, and also where quantum algorithms fundamentally get their power from and what their limitations are.
So that's, that's where, um, that's where we're ultimately going. But how are we going to get there? <laughs> well, I know most of you come from computer science, and so the prospect of jumping in and learning quantum theory within a short period of time probably seems pretty daunting. And the truth of the matter is, it well, it is. Quantum mechanics and quantum theory are very, very deep subjects, and you can spend your entire career thinking about them. However, that being said, we're, the aim of this course is to give you enough that you're going to be able to be functional within about two lectures. <laughs> so that might be a bit of an ambitious goal, but I, I really think that it's po quite, quite possible for you to learn enough in order to understand what quantum computing really is and how, how to work with it very quickly. So the way that I'm going to be doing this is very different from the way most presentations end up going. Most of the time, people would begin by uh, giving you an introduction to quantum theory. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to bootstrap from ordinary computing going up to reversible computing, probabilistic reversible computing, and then talking about quantum computing, all of which are generalizations of the previous ones. And so, by building up this sort of set of different paradigms, we've got, you know, ordinary computing here, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to show that ordinary computing, that is equivalent to reversible computing. And I'll explain what reversible computing is later, but the idea basically is that it's computing that, ha that only uses gates that can be undone. Then we're going to slightly generalize this to include probabilistic uh, functions. So situations where you've got bits that come in that aren't necessarily guaranteed to have particular values. Instead, we're going to assume that we're given a probability distribution over 0 and 1. And then, finally, once we do this, we're going to do a slight, slight, slight modification of this to instead of having prob uh, probabilistic uh, bits, we're going to have quantum bits. As input, all right, and that's that is that is basically how the outline of this is going to go. And if you can follow each and every one of these steps, the, the transition from what you know about ordinary computing to quantum computing, I think, is actually relatively straightforward. Also, the other thing is is that it by presenting the material in this way, it's my hope that many of you won't get sucked into some of the traps that people have about directly trying to compare ordinary computing to quantum computing. Instead, the most natural point of comparison is between quantum computing and probabilistic classical computing. And I think by building up this framework like this, many of the paradoxes that people end up getting tripped up in regarding quantum mechanics, actually in general, but quantum computing in particular, kind of actually fall by the wayside. And so that's why I'm going to be focusing on this particular approach. But in order to do that, I need to begin with the center of this and explain what reversible computing is. So first up, Ordinary computing. Okay, many of you, of course, are experts in this, and I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't deign to lecture on this. But let's just do a little bit of a quick refresher about this. So, all of this we're going to be thinking about from the perspective of a very low-level view. So, we're going to be looking at individual transformations on bits. So. The idea basically is that we end up having a, what we want to be able to do is we want to be, be, be able to build a universal computer. And what a universal computer is capable of doing is that for any computable function that maps n 
bits to m bits, what we want, would like to be able to do is we would like to be able to uh, find a sequence of gates inside a finite gate set to implement F. Okay? And so if we can always, for any computable function F, find a sequence of gates inside a finite gate set to do it, then we say that this model of computing is universal. Okay? So the, that's the basic, basic idea behind the um, behind universality here. And so the simplest universal gate set that we, we can we can view for an ordinary computer will be the following. Okay. So it would be a not gate. Not gate takes an input A and outputs not A. So for example, if we view its truth table, we have a, a in we've got out over here. We have only two inputs. If it's zero then a NOT gate outputs 1. If it's 1, then a NOT gate outputs 0. All right, cool. So that's that's easy. The next thing that we end up needing is a AND gate. Now, an AND gate, it's a nonlinear gate. And so what it does is it puts in A and B, and it outputs the product of A and B. Now, again, recall that the product over here is over bits, and so this is a product mod 2. So if we have uh, in over here, or let's call it A and B, and out, if we have 0 and 0, well, the product of 0 and 0 is 0, 0 and 1, 0, 1 and 0, 0, 1 and 1 now yields 1. And so that is how A AND gate works. And with not and and put together, it's uh, it's a, it's well known that not plus and are universal. Okay, meaning that in principle any program that you can that you can run can be compiled down into just not and and gates. All right, cool. So. Where does reversible computing come in? Well, reversible computing actually has a long history. Reversible computing is older than quantum computing. And the idea behind this was actually proposed by Landauer. And Landauer was inspired actually by physical principles, uh, the physical principles behind computing, actually in a very similar way to how Feynman was um, inspired. To Landauer, he looked at a gate like the AND gate and said, hey, what you've got with AND is AND maps two bits to one bit. This means one bit is erased. So what the question that he asked is, does thermodynamics place limits on the energy needed for this. Well, from statistical physics, you can actually show that if you're carrying out this erasing process at finite temperature, then you've got to end up using an amount of energy to erase that bit, that is equal to kT times the change in entropy, which is ln 2. Oh, by the way, in this course, log is base 2, always. If I mean base e, I will say ln. But in any case, this ends up saying that at finite temperature, there's an, actually an energy cost associated with this. So Landauer was interested in reversible computing because 
In principle, if no bits of information are lost along the way, then no energy needs to be consumed by computation, at least from the perspective of the laws of thermodynamics. So that is the basic justification for it. It also, as we'll end up seeing, is sort of the cornerstone or the, the bedrock on which quantum computing is ultimately built. So to go forward in this, we got to ask, okay, well, what, how can we end up building something that looks universal out of reversible computing? The first way, a person who ended up proposing this is actually um, uh, Charlie Bennett. Charlie Bennett, interestingly enough, he's had a wide array of impacts over the years, and in fact, has made seminal contributions that I'll come back to in quantum computing. But this came out in the 70s, well before quantum computing, and Bennett was the first person to, to think about how we could reversibly do functions in general. But to give you a particular case, let's look at the AND gate again. You know, with AND, we've got A and B, and we have A times B. Now, in the event that we know that A times B is 1, then, well, we actually do know what A and B are. They're 1. If A and B are zero, however, we don't have enough information on the output to go back to the inputs. So what this means is this means that the gate is, well, fundamentally irreversible because we can't invert it. So how would we build um, a reversible version of this? Well, there's actually a really, really easy way of doing this. The easiest way is to say, well, instead of encoding everything as just using two bits, now let's build this up into three bits over here, okay? And instead, have the following function that I'm gonna, and I'm gonna call this, this is an, uh, an AND gate here. This is another gate over here called a Toffoli gate. And as you can see, it acts like a reversible AND where it does the following. Okay, now let me just again remind you of what this notation here is. This is of uh, the exclusive OR. And so C um, exclusive OR AB, that is equal to just C plus A times B mod two. All right, so if both of them are one, then they add up to zero. If they're both zero, they add up to zero. If only one of them is zero, well, then they add up to one. Okay, so that's how the Toffoli gate ends up working. Now you'll see that from the output over here, we actually have all the information that we need to go backwards because after all, A and B weren't destroyed. Also, the other thing is, is that we can actually manifestly invert this. So let's consider applying two Toffoli gates. Like this, okay? We've got A, B, and C, which are just general input values coming in. So we agreed that coming from the first line, what we end up getting is we will get that this will end up yielding the same thing as A, B, C, exclusive, or A times B. Okay. Now, we feed that into a Toffoli gate again, and lo and behold, what we end up getting, popping out, is we get A and B, because those inputs are never changed by the Toffoli gate. Now, we get C exclusive, or A times B, exclusive, or A times B, now, we can use the associative property of this to give us, on the bottom row, C exclusive or AB exclusive or AB. Now, this is equal to C plus AB plus AB mod 2. That's equal to C plus 2AB mod 2. Two. But because A and B are 
inside the group 0, 1, 2ab is 0 mod 2. So that's equal to c. Therefore, Toffoli gate is e equal to the Toffoli gate inverted. Okay, cool. So now you can see that we've, we've, by doing this, we've now built ourselves a reversible version of AND. Now, NOT, fortunately, is reversible, because after all, if we NOT twice, we've got A, NOT A, and then NOT, NOT A, which is equal to A. So therefore, by combining these two things together, we have the ability to carry out a reversible version of, a, of, of any circuit. The catch is you have to keep A and B around. So to give an example, let's say what we want to do is we want to build a different um, network. Let's say what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to build the following function that takes on three inputs. Let's say it's got A, B, C, and it's got an output D over here. And what we want to do is we want to map that to A, B, C, D, exclusive or a b c so this is kind of like a and gate except what it does is it computes the and of the first three and outputs the result in d okay so how are we going to build this guy well the way we can build this is by saying that well first thing we can do is we can compute let's say we begin with a and b over here by doing a Toffoli gate, we can end up building following a, b, and a times b. All right, cool. So now, if we wanted to be able to, what we can do by adding an extra bit down at the bottom containing d, and uh, this one is c. Then, by putting a Toffoli gate in here, what we will get is we will get D exclusive or A, B, C over here, C and A, B. So we've implemented this function, which is effectively the product of A, B, and C, but the problem is, is that we have to carry around all this additional crap here. And unfortunately, this, this leads to a lot of overheads. And so for that, those reasons, actually reversible computing kind of didn't really end up catching up as much as many people had hoped, especially in an energy conscious era like we've ended up uh, coming into. Really, it's the fact that it's a starting point for quantum computing that have gotten people really excited about reversible computing lately. So. Now that I've given you an idea about this, let's actually now take a little bit of a deeper view of um, reversible computing and translate it to language that's going to allow us to build a bridge easier between where we are right now and where we need to be to understand uh, quantum theory. And so to begin with, let's talk about numbers. Okay. There's two types of encodings that we that are broadly used. Okay, well, there's many types of encodings for numbers, but there's two broad ones that we're going to be spending much of our time talking about. And so the standard encoding, of course, that you know everybody always thinks about in computer science when we're approaching things is binary encoding. So in binary, what we would have is we would have um, this would be say zero 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 one one zero one one. As established before, if we have n bits, then the biggest number that we can end up uh, storing is 2 to the n. All right, great. And so 
Another approach that we can use is a unary encoding. And in particular, this is a uh, called a one-hot encoding. So the this representation would represent zero as the following. And one, like this, two, like that, and three, like that. Okay, now looking at it, this looks like a very stupid way to store numbers because, well, how many how many ones and zeros we need here? We, if we, we need like n bits can represent a number that's as big as n. <laughs> so despite that, there's actually some great theoretical reasons why this representation is nice because it actually allows us to start thinking about these reversible transformations like I, I gave previously as matrices. And these ma matrices give the language, the linear, linear algebraic language that underpins all of quantum computing. But we can just focus on ordinary computing for the moment. So this is what we, this is our, our representation of the numbers, but we can also represent these numbers slightly differently. You'll note that with this encoding, each of them actually is a distinct unit vector. So I'm going to write zero as being equivalent in this representation to a unit vector E zero, which is equal to one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, one, I'm gonna write as E one, which is equivalent to zero, one, zero, zero. So you see, that's really just the transpose of these objects up here, well, depending on your ordering. <laughs> and the so these are these are vectors that we can propose in order to do this. And so now we can think about well, what our gate operations do. So if we envision this on one bit, not what does it do? Well, it maps e0 to e1 and it maps e1 to e0 and so this actually gives us a way to figure out what a matrix representation of the not gate would be here so for the not gate this is equivalent to E not transpose not E not E one or E not transpose not E one E one transpose not E zero E one transpose not E one. Okay, great. So now we just have to figure out what these inner products are. So first off, we can, just by using these rules, this ends up giving us E naught transpose E1 times E naught, or sorry, E naught, or yeah, E1, E naught transpose, or, um, E naught, E1 transpose E1 and E1 transpose E0. This is equal to 0, 1, 1, 0. So this is a matrix representation using this. And for those of you who've got a little bit of quantum uh, background, you'll notice that this is equal to the poly X gate, sometimes called sigma X as well. This poly X gate is going to be of central importance to our discussions going forward. And in fact, it's probably the first actual representation of a quantum gate that you're that you'll see in this course. But that's that's the beginning of this. So, OK, cool. But how does this end up helping us from from the perspective of formalism? Well, one thing that's very nice about this formalism is the fact that it ends up actually allowing us to use linear algebra in order to be able to build larger vectors. So for example, 
say we I wanted to represent the um, the value zero, but I want to be able to do this on um, two bits. The number zero on two bits is in one hot encoding, as mentioned, just that, which translates to one zero zero zero. Okay. Well, actually, one thing that's very cool about this is that we can express this vector, actually, using this operation called a tensor product. And this explicitly ends up taking the form of E0 tensor E0. Okay. And so that's the, the, that's the tensor product operation that we've uh, that we've got and there's a couple of properties about the tensor product that um, that you need to know it, this is a central thing for this course by the way so I recommend getting getting pretty familiar with it so properties of the tensor product first off just like any other product it is, um, well, not any other, but all the ones that you're familiar with, it's associative. So for any matrices, A and B, we have A plus B tensor C is equal to A tensor C plus B tensor C. We, it, it's, it also satisfies that if we have A, A tensor B, B, that's just equal to AB times A tensor B for scalar A and B. All right. So that's the first property. This is, this is the second property. Third property is that for, um, at least for the norms that we're interested in, in this, particularly Staten norms, we have that the norm of a tensor B is equal to the norm of A times the norm of B. All right. Now, the next thing is probably the most operationally important property. For two matrices in general, the tensor product between A and B is of the form over here. Now, I'm representing this as a block matrix, so I'll explain in more detail what I mean by this. So that is how you end up uh, uh, doing this. So in particular, these over here, these are each a block matrix. So each of these, if B is a, a D by D square matrix, for example, each of these would be a D by D block. So just view it as a scalar multiplied by whatever the object on the right is. And that's how you, you end up forming it. So tensor products end up actually having dimensions that grow exponentially. So dim of uh, a tensor B is equal to dim A All right, so that's basically it. Now, let me, again, give you an example of this. Let's take a look at it for vectors. Let's look at E0 tensor E0. This is the same thing as 1, 0 tensor 1, 0. Now, this takes the role of A, and that takes the role of B using our description above. So if we do that, then the first thing that we get is A0, 0, which in this case is 1, 
times one, zero correspond to just that block down there. Now we've unfortunately only got a second one in this example, this component over here, which is zero times one, zero. Because again, B is one, zero, and this coefficient over here is zero. So this, when I expand this out, is just one, zero in this block, and now zero, zero, because again, zero times any vector is always zero. So, and this, is equivalent to the bit string zero zero. So this is really kind of cool. Now let's do another example. Let's do e1 tensor e0. That is equal to zero one tensor one zero. That now is equal to zero times one zero and one times one zero and that is equal to zero zero one zero okay which is in binary one zero so you see that actually this notation is very nice because it gives you a way to swap back and forth between this binary and this and unary encoding. So that's one thing that we can do. Now, now that I've taught, uh, and this tells you effectively how you can build any uh, um, bit string. So for example, you know, let's say I wanted to encode the number five over here. Well, five in binary is one, zero, one. And so following this rule that we've got up above here, what this should be is it should be E1 tensor E0 tensor E1. Great. So now this ends up uh, yielding the following. When we expand this out, this is 0, 1 tensor 1, 0 tensor 0, 1. And when you go through all the math for that, you end up getting 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, which is equivalent to 5. So you can see that, yeah, we can use this in order to jump back and forth between binary and um, this one-hot encoding. That, that allows us to use all the power of linear algebra. So the next thing and the final thing that I wanted to talk about is, all right, great, if our objects over here are um, formed by tensor products, can we think about our gates that way? So if we wanted to consider the following situation where we have A maps to not A over here, and B maps to not B, we can actually view this as a tensor product of not operations. So this, if we look at its matrix representation, is exactly the same thing as not tensor not. Okay, now in order to see this, again, if we recall what not is, that 0, 1, 1, 0, tensor 0, 1, 1, 0. Now let's use our rules for tensor products, except now we've got something that's a little bit bigger. Now we have to build this up as zero times one, zero. This is one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero. When we do this tensor product, which is now a four by four matrix because dimension two times dimension two. So this ends up yielding 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, and now you can see immediately, all right, well, what happens for this? Say this matrix were to act on the state um, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, this corresponds to E0, 0. 
which is E naught tensor E naught. Okay, this from matrix multiplication just ends up yielding three zeros and a one. Okay, cool. So this is our this is our output state, and now we have um, and now you see that this ends up being equal to E one one. So this we can use the properties of tensor products in order to talk about how parallel operations end up carrying out. In fact, actually, this is a property of a another fact of tensor products that I forgot to tell you. That's quite important. Property five of tensor products is that if we have a tensor B times C tensor D, that is equal to a C tensor B D. Okay, and I I got to of course remind you that uh, well these properties hold commutation definitely does not hold so we can't change the orders of all of these so to write this in a matrix fashion the not gate on the first one over here would correspond to not on that one and you do nothing on the second one so we'll write that as an identity over here then the next operation that we're carrying out the second one down here does nothing on the first bit and does a not gate on the second one. You can see immediately that these transformations that you're going to get out of it will correspond exactly to what would happen for, if you ran the, these not gates in isolation. And that is why this ends up being the tensor product of two knots. However, that's not necessary. There are other gates that can't necess that won't won't be built up like this. Obviously, the Toffoli gate can't be built up like this because otherwise, well, you wouldn't be able to have interactions or nonlinearities between things. But to give you a simple example before going into that more compl complicated example, let's take a look at figuring out the matrix representation for an operation known as a uh, controlled knot. So the controlled knot operation ends up working as, as for it follows. We've got a control bit. And then we have a target. And if control is one, then what we do is we flip the target. So let's do a truth table to show, uh, to, to sh uh, show what ends up happening. If we have in input, zero, zero, Assuming that this one is the control, then nothing happens. The second bit isn't flipped. And so this will be 0, 0 as well. Now, if we have 0, 1, again, the second bit doesn't flip. It's 0, 1. Next, we have 1, 0. Well, in this case, it does flip. And finally, 1, 1 flips. All right. So that is how a controlled NOT gate would operate. In order for us to be able to now view this as a matrix, what we can do is we can call it this gate, which is often called C naught. We can express this as a matrix of the form E naught transpose C naught E one one um, E zero zero E Transpose C naught E one zero E zero one transpose C naught E zero zero E zero one transpose C naught E zero one going all the way down to E11, transpose C naught E11. Okay, great. And now we can just use the truth table going through exactly the same logic that we went through before. 
From this, over here, what we have is that C0 acting on E00 will give us E00. These two, because they're parallel vectors, they become 1. Similarly, 0, 1 yields 0, 1. So these two, this is um, 0, 1 again, and therefore this whole bit is 1. The parts that are going to be different will be, well, this one I inconveniently didn't draw down here and there. Those two correspond to the flipped examples. And so when we go through and we evaluate all of those matrix elements using the truth table, we end up finding that its matrix representation is of the form 1, 1, 0, 1. Great. And that's how we, we end up uh, doing this. So for the case of a um, Toffoli gate, a Toffoli gate, which is, again, a reversible version of a AND, we can actually go through the exact same reasoning and see that it can be expressed as a bunch of ones <laughs> going down over here. I just need to keep track to make sure I've got enough. Yeah, I think I do. One, zero. This would be the representation of the Toffoli gate, and it's zero elsewhere. And again, I, I suggest as an exercise going through this and uh, working that out and validating that you can understand where this is coming from. But OK, cool. So where where is this? going at the moment. Well, where this is going is this is really just presenting our a linear algebraic background for what our fundamental gates are. Next time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin generalizing this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, first off, I'll do a brief um, review of why the AND gate or the Toffoli gate is universal for classical computing here, and show how Bennett's trick can be used in order to be able to decompose any arbitrary logic into a sequence of permutations. And so that is, that is basically what's going to be happening with reversible computing. Then I'm going to talk about how we can throw probability distributions on top of it. And then finally, I'm going to do a slight generalization and show how you can end up creating quantum distributions for this. And then at that point, you'll understand most of what you will need in order to be functional at quantum computing. But I need to emphasize that, well, that's enough for you to understand, the, will be enough for you to understand the basics of quantum theory. Quantum mechanics is a very, very deep well, and there's a lot more to it than just the many of these things. But still, it's actually quite surprising how little is ultimately required in order for you to be able to work inside the computational model of quantum computing. And so, well, thank you very much. I hope if you guys have questions about any of this that you'll raise them and <laughs> that, uh, yeah, um, thank you very much. And I hope that, um, yeah, I hope that we'll be in close communication and that if any of you need any assistance or uh, need any clarification, that please, reach out to me at any time. Thanks a lot, and uh, well, I'll see you later.